Hello. Welcome to the Bore You to Sleep podcast. The podcast that will hopefully help you get to sleep. I am going to read an open source book, one that is not particularly interesting, but one that is hopefully boring enough to get you to sleep. Tonight's reading comes from The Peacock Feather, written by Leslie Moore. This book follows the story of Peter, a journeyman with a story of his own. Firstly, Happy New Year and a happy holiday season to you. I wish you and your families the best 2023 that you can possibly have. I know last year was a difficult one for many, and I'm grateful to play a part in your life by allowing you to get the sleep that you need to succeed. My name is Teddy, and I aim to help people everywhere get a good night's rest. Sleep is so important, and my mission is to help you get the rest that you need. The podcast is designed to play in the background while you slowly fall asleep. Thank you to all the listeners who reached out over the holiday period to share their gratitude with me. It's so great to hear from those who receive benefit from the podcast, and it's such a compliment when you are able to leave a review or rating in your podcast app. Thank you to Shannon Ramirez for your lovely message through the website. I'm sorry to hear about your relationship and I'm glad the podcast is helping you get some sleep. Thank you to Jennifer Hudson for your message through the website. I'm glad the podcast is helping you deal with your night shifts. Thank you to Jordan Haller for your lovely Christmas message through the website and kind offer of donation. I also wish you and your family well. And finally, thank you to Diane Brockfartney for your lovely Christmas message. Hopefully I've got the pronunciation correct this time. As always, I'm extremely grateful to all of the patron supporters and anchor sponsors who support the show financially with a monthly contribution. Whether it's $1 or $5, Your contribution allows me to bring out more episodes to you and those who need them. If you would like to become a patron or sponsor, please visit boytosleep.com where you can support the podcast. I understand that not everybody can support the podcast with a financial contribution, but there is a small and hugely helpful favour that you can provide. Please share the podcast with a friend, and if possible, kindly leave a review in your podcast app. There are lots of people out there who are struggling with sleep, and my goal is to help as many people get the sleep that they need. If you would like, you can also say hello at boytosleep.com. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram at boytosleep. You can find me on Facebook by searching Boy to Sleep Podcast. In the meantime, lie back, relax, and enjoy the readings. The Peacock Feather Prologue It was sunset. The sea, which all day long had lain blue and sparkling, was changing slowly to a warm grey shot with moving purple and gold. The flame fanned with crimson and amber. But gradually, the vivid warmth sank and faded. Day slowly withdrew into the soft embrace of night. And a blue-grey mantle covered sea and sky and land. One by one, The stars shone forth till overhead. The mantle was thickly powdered with their twinkling eyes. Away across the water, 
the gleam from the lantern of a light ship appeared at intervals, while every now and then a stronger flash from a distant lighthouse lit up in the darkness. It flung its rays broadcast across the water, across the land, bringing momentarily into startling prominence a great mass of buildings standing on top of the cliffs. In the building, a man was clinging with both hands to a couple of iron bars that guarded the narrow opening of his cell window. He could see across the water and up to the star-embroidered mantle of the sky. Night after night, for three years, he had looked at that moving water. He had seen it lying calm and peaceful as it lay tonight. He had seen it rearing angry foam, crested waves, from inky blackness. He had heard its soft, sighing music. He had heard its sullen roar. Three years, more than a thousand nights, he had looked from that narrow slit of a window, his hands fast clutching the bars, his feet finding slight and precarious footholds in the uneven surface of the wall. And tonight he looked for the last time. Tomorrow he would be free. Free as the seagulls which circled and dipped in the water along the rocky coast or rose screaming and battling against the tearing wind. He slipped down from the window and crossed to his pallet bed. Free until tonight, he had never even dared to whisper that word to his inmost soul. Throughout the long three years, he had been refused and let himself to think more than one day for the moment. He had held his mind in close confinement, a confinement even more stringent than that to which his body was subjected. Now in that little cell, he opened the windows of his soul and let his mind go forth. Radiant, exuberant, it escaped from its cage. It came forth singing a te deum. Only a few more hours and dawn would break. His body would know the liberty he had already given to his mind. He was too happy to sleep. He lay wakeful and very still on his bed. The silence only occasionally broken by the footfall of a water in the passage outside. The night wore on. Gradually the stars dropped back one by one into the sky, and away in the east a streak of saffron light appeared. It was day at last. Six hours later, a man was walking along a country road. His step was light and his face held up to meet the fresh March wind that was blowing across the fields and hedges. Daffodils nodded their golden heads at him from the banks as he passed, and tiny green buds on the brown branches were pushing forward to the light. The whole world was vital radiant, teeming with growth. The man held one hand in the pocket of his grey flannel coat, his fingers pressing on two envelopes which lay there. They had been handed to him just before he left the great grey prison. He had not yet opened them. For one thing, 
He wanted to put a certain distance between his present self and the past three years before he broke the seals. For another thing, he was denying himself, prolonging the pleasure of anticipation. Now he saw a stile before him, set in the hedge a little way back from the road, and with a patch of grass before it. In the grass gleamed a few pink-tipped daisies. The man went across the grass and sat down on the stile. He pulled the two letters from his pocket and looked at them. One was addressed in a masculine handwriting, small, square and very firm. The other writing was delicate but larger, It was evidently that of a woman. He opened the firmly addressed envelope first and pulled out its contents. A strip of pink paper fluttered to the ground, falling among the daisies. He picked it up without looking at it while he read the contents of the letter. I have no desire that you should starve, and therefore send you the enclosed. Kindly understand, however, that I do not wish to see you for the present. When you have partially blotted out the past by obtaining decent work and proving your repentance, I will consider this decision. Richard Carden The check was for two hundred pounds. The man laughed, but the sound of his laugh was not very pleasant. He broke the seal of the second letter. I did not write before the letter ran, because I did not want to see you brood over what I have to say, though you must have known that my saying it was inevitable. Of course you have known from the first that you have by your own conduct put an end to our engagement. I did not write at once and tell you so myself, for fear of adding to your pain. But you must have understood. You will not attempt to see me or write to me. It would be quite useless. I am going to be married in three weeks' time. I am very sorry for you, and I would have helped you if I could. But you must see for yourself it is impossible. There is nothing now to say but goodbye. M. When the man had finished reading, he sat very still, so still that a robin hopped down near him and began investigating the toe of his boat. Finding nothing in a piece of black leather of interest, it flew up to the hedge and regarded the motionless figure with round, beady eyes. At last the figure moved, The robin flew a couple of yards farther away, then perched again to watch. It saw the man tearing white and pink paper into very small pieces. Then it saw him bend down and dig a hole in the earth with a clasp knife. It saw him place the pieces of torn paper in the hole and replace the earth, which he pressed firmly down. Then it heard the man speak. At least I will give the past a decent burial. The robin did not understand the words. What has a happy little red breast to do with either the past or the future. 
the moment is quite enough. Then the man stood up and the robin saw his face. It had grown much older in the last twenty minutes. And now, said the man jauntily, though his eyes belied the carelessness of the words, for the open road. Perhaps the robin understood that speech. At any rate, it sang a sweet, sturdy song of Amen. Chapter 1 The Piper Peter was sitting under a hedge, playing on a penny whistle. Behind him was a bush, snowy with the white flowers of the hawthorn. In front of him was a field, warm with the gold of buttercups. Away in a distant valley were the roofs of cottages and farmhouses. The smoke from one of its chimney rose thin and blue in the still air. It was all very peaceful, ideally English. Peter was an artist. It seemed almost incredible that a tin instrument which could be purchased for a penny could be made to produce such sounds. He was playing a joyous lilt. You could hear the song of birds and feel the soft west wind blowing from distant places. And through it was a measured beat as of feet walking along the open road. Yet under all the gaiety and the light-heartedness lay a strange minor note, a note that somehow found reflection in Peter's blue eyes. Peter finished his tune and put the whistle pipe in his pocket. From a wallet beside him he pulled out a hunch of bread and cheese and a very red and shiny apple. He opened a large clasp knife, cut the hunch of bread in two and fell to eating slowly. His hands were long-fingered, flexible and very brown. There was a lean, muscular look about Peter altogether. His clothes were distinctly shabby. They consisted of a pair of grey trousers, very frayed at the edges, and with a patch of some darker material on one knee. A soft white shirt, spotlessly clean, and a loose jacket, grey flannel-like trousers. A felt hat lay on the ground near him. In it was fantastically stuck a peacock feather. Beside the hat was a small bundle, rolled up in a bit of sacking. Peter finished the bread and cheese and the apple, and put the clasp knife back into his pocket. From another pocket, he pulled out a small book, the cover rather limp and worn. He tucked the bundle behind his back and opened the book. Its contents did not long engross him. The warm May sun and the fact that he had tramped a considerable number of miles since sunrise had a soporific effect on Peter. His fingers gradually relaxed their hold. The book fell to the ground, and Peter slept. His slumber was so deep that he did not hear the footfall of a man on the soft grass, nor did he stir when the man came near and stood looking down upon him. He was a man of medium height and build, with brown hair, small moustache, and rather light eyes. There was about him an air of finish, 
yet he quite escaped the epithet of Dapper. For a moment or so, he stood looking down upon the recumbent figure. He took in every detail from the frayed trousers and the spotless shirt to the fantastic feather in the hat. He saw that the sleeper's face was a clean-shaven, bronzed and with rather high cheekbones. The hair was dark. There was in the sleeping face a look of quiet weariness. To the man watching him, it was the face of one who was lonely. Then his eyes fell upon the book. He stooped down and gently picked it up. The book was open at the following lines. Sin I fro love escaped am so fat. I never thank to ban in prison lean. Sin I am free. I count him not a bean. He may answer and say this or that. I do not fause. I speak right as I mean. Sin I fro, love escaped, am so fat. I never think to bean in the prison lean. Love hath my name, why strike out of his scalt, and he is strike out of my bones clean. Forever mo, there is none other mean. Sin I fro, love escaped, am so fat. I never think to ben in his prison lean. Sin I am free, I count him not a bean. Ten minutes later, Peter stirred and yawned. He sat up and began to stretch himself. But in the very act thereof he stopped, and a gleam of humorous amazement shot into his blue eyes, for on the grass beside him was a man sitting, calmly reading from his own rather shabby book. The man looked up. Don't let me interrupt you, said Peter, with a brilliant smile. The man laughed. I ought to apologize, he said. The fact is, when I first saw you lying there asleep, I took you for a tramp. Then I came nearer and saw my mistake. I also saw the book. The temptation to talk to a man who obviously loved the open air and read Chaucer was too much for me. I sat down to wait till you should awake. Very good of you, replied Peter, but you didn't make a mistake. I am a tramp. So am I, responded the other, on a walking tour. Peter sat up very deliberately now. He broke off a piece of grass, which he began to nibble. Through the nibbling, he spoke. But I presume that your walking tour is of fairly brief duration. Mine has lasted rather more than two years. The other man looked at him curiously. You love the open as much as that. Oh, I love the open well enough, replied Peter airily, but that's not the whole reason. I can't afford a roof. Now the very obvious reply to this would have been that Peter, a young man and moreover clearly one of education, might very well work for a roof. But it being so extremely obvious that this was what Peter might do, it was also obvious that there was some excellent reason why he did not do it. The man was silent. Peter appreciated his silence. The fact is, said Peter deliberately, 
that prior to my starting this walking tour, as you so kindly term it, I had spent three years in prison for forgery and embezzling a considerable sum of money. Ah, said the man quietly, watching him. There are always the colonies, went on Peter carelessly. But somehow, I've a predilection for England. Of course, in England, there is the disadvantage that you're bound to produce references if you want work. I mean the kind of work that would appeal to me. I dare say I might get taken on as a day labourer on a farm. But even there, my speech is against me. It makes people suspicious. But how do you manage? asked the other curiously. Peter laughed. He pulled his whistle pipe from his pocket. I pipe for my bread, he said. They call me Peter the Piper. The other man nodded. Good, he said. I like that. There's a flavour of romance about it that appeals to me. My name's Neil MacDonald. Peter looked at him. Then you don't mind introducing yourself to a jailbird, he asked jauntily. But there was an underhint of wistfulness in his words. My dear fellow, responded Neil, I have some intuition. It's absolutely apparent that you must have been shielding someone or else that... Peter interrupted him. The pupils of his blue eyes had contracted till they looked like two pinpricks. I beg your pardon, he said slowly. I said that I spent three years in prison for forgery and embezzlement. He looked Neil full in the face. Neil held out his hand. I apologise, he said. It was extremely clumsy of me. Peter took his hand with a light laugh. It was rather decent of you. All the same, he said, though of course, utterly absurd. You're the first man, though, that's committed the absurdity. You happen to, to be the man with whom I've shaken hands since I freed myself from the clasp of a Salvation Army brother who met me outside the prison gates and talked about my soul. I hadn't the smallest interest in my soul at the moment. I wanted a cigarette and a drink more than anything in heaven or earth. He was a good-meaning fellow, of course, but, well, just a little wanting intact. Of course, there were others ready to hold out the hand of pity if I'd asked for it but there'd have to be something slippery about the touch. The oil of charity doesn't appeal to me. There was a pause. Somewhere in the blueness a lark was singing, an exuberant feathered morsel, pouring forth his very soul in song. Neil broke the silence. Pipe to me, he said. Peter laughed, he pulled the whistle from his pocket, and his fingers held it very lovingly. He put it to his lips. First there came a couple of clear notes, like a bird call. They repeated themselves in the distance and were answered. Then the air became alive with the joyous warbling of feathered choristers. And through the warbling came the sound of little rills chasing each other over brown stones where fish darted in the sunlight and dragonflies skimmed. Next, across a meadow, one knew it was a meadow, 
came the sound of little feet and children's laughter, and the sound of the laughter, and the babbling of the water, and the song of the birds were all mingled in one delicious bubbling melody, drawn from the very heart of nature. It came to a pause. You felt the children, the birds, and the brooks hold their breath to listen. And then from the branches of some tree, a hidden nightingale sang alone. Peter stopped, wiped the pipe on his sleeve and put it back in his pocket. Marvellous breathed Neil softly. Again there was a pause and again it was broken by Neil. I say, will you come back and have lunch with me? There was a frank spontaneity about the question. Again the wistful look crept into Peter's blue eyes. The suggestion coming suddenly was evidently somewhat of a temptation. I believe I'd like to, he said lightly. But, well, asked Neil. Peter shook his head. I think not, he said. There are quite 999 reasons against it, and only one for it. And isn't the reason good enough to counteract the others? Peter laughed. I fancy not. The high road has claimed me. The hedge side is my dining place. The sky, my roof. When it is too unkind to me, I seek shelter in a barn. I've struck up a kind of silent intimacy with cows, sheep and horses. I've found them, indeed, quite pleased to welcome me. It must be horribly lonely, said Neil impulsively. Peter looked away across the valley. I wonder, he said, perhaps it only appears so. Formerly, I walked the earth in company, and when I got near enough to a fellow creature to believe that I had the right to call him comrade, I suddenly realized that I was looking into the face of a complete stranger. Somehow the loneliness struck deeper home at those moments. Now, well... One just expects nothing. Neil glanced down at the book he was still holding in his hand. Peter smiled. Love hath my name, why strike out of his sclat? And he is strike out of my books clean, forevermore. Sin I am free, I count him not a bane. He quoted, There's a freedom about that, a kind of clean washedness which is very wholesome. The fresh rain is upon one's face in high places. After a room full of hot house flowers, he stopped, heaven knows why I am talking to you like this, he said whimsically. I don't fancy, said Neil calmly that you've ever been really in love. No, smiled Peter. Of course, you think you have, went on Neil. Indeed, smiled Peter again. Oh, I'm not going to argue with you, said the other good-humouredly. Only when the time comes that you do love, just do me the favour to remember what I've said. He is strike out of my bokes clean, quoted Peter again, looking at Neil lazily. There is, said Neil, such a thing as invisible ink. There are certain words written with it on the pages of our lives. The pages look uncommonly blank, but should they chance to catch certain heat rays, 
the words written upon them will stand out very black and clear. Humph, said Peter. Wait and see, said Neil. All right, said Peter, and then he got to his feet. He picked up his wallet, bundle, and the hat with the peacock feather. He put it jauntily on his head. I must be moving on, he said. Neil, too, had risen. He held out his limp book. Peter took it and put it in his pocket. Chaucer or you, he said. Which am I to believe? Believe which you like, retorted Neil. Time will bring the proof. I'm glad I met you, he held out his hand. Peter took it. Common politeness, he said, should make me echo that sentiment. Truth obliges me to hesitate. Yet frankly, I like you. Perhaps you have sufficient acumen to guess at the reason for my hesitation. Well, goodbye. Peter vaulted over a stile that led him into the high road. He turned and waved his hat in the direction of the man looking after him, then started off at a swinging pace. Ten minutes took him into the valley, then he began to ascend. Part way up the hill, he turned and looked at the now distant field. Oh damn, he said half ruefully, why the devil did I meet him? And that concludes tonight's readings. I hope you enjoyed listening to that rather pleasant and peaceful story about Peter. I hope you're also feeling a little drowsy. If you're not quite drowsy yet, please feel free to listen to another episode. In the meantime, I'll be working on bringing out a new episode for you very soon. Good night.